Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Steve DeMello, Director of Healthcare here at Citrus. Very glad to welcome you to the uh, first research exchange of the new school year. A um, couple of announcements first. We'd like to welcome our web viewers uh, from the various campuses. Uh, remind you that the uh, first Eye for Energy talk will be this week on Friday. Subject is cooling off energy systems. And uh, note that today at 5 p.m. in Blum Hall, there'll be a presentation on the Big, Eye, Big Ideas at Berkeley Information Session, special presentation by Back to the Roots, who were one of the original winners of the competition. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Ada Poon, who will be speaking to us today on emerging wireless applications in biomedicine. Professor Poon earned her PhD here at Berkeley in 2004. Following graduation, she worked at Intel as a senior research scientist and at SIGBeam, where she architected gigabit wireless receivers. She returned to academia at University of Illinois Chicago um, Champaign-Urbana, and since then has changed her research direction from wireless communication to biomedical systems. In 2008, she moved back to California and joined the faculty at Stanford in the Department of Electrical Engineering, where she's also a Terman Fellow. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ada Poon. Thanks, Steve. Um, okay. So first of all, I would like to go over the kind of projects that we are doing in our lab, and then I will select a few of them and talk about it in more detail. Um, so this is the kind of projects that we are doing in our lab that we are studying the fundamental, more fundamental of how to transmit power wirelessly uh, from an external devices to an implant that is inside the body. So with this implant, what we are going to do, uh, we build a, a locomotive implant that is uh, able to uh, hopefully uh, streaming inside. For example, here is a bloodstream uh, with remote control from these external devices. So these devices, there's no battery, everything it is from uh, the power and also the control signals are from the external uh, device. And we are also working with a cardiologist. We try to build very small electro sensors, what we call the intercardial probes, that is put in on the surface of the coronary, put in on the coronary arteries that is on the surface of the left ventricle. Uh, what we're trying to do it is to trace back the electrical pathway of the signals from the top of the heart to the bottom and then going back. So if there's any arrhythmia, um, the, the, um, the zero causing, for example, of these uh, pulses will be different. And these are, the, these are the devices that we are targeting at. So that's the antenna, the silicon trip, and the electrodes that we try to put everything very compactly into a volume of less than one millimeter cube. Um, going even further, we want to make the devices even further, that this is a silicon chip that we built and put inside a macrophage, which is um, a white blood cell. Uh, we want to interrogate it from the external devices to see, you know, right now we just want to achieve the purpose of tagging. For example, this is cell number one, cell number two, or cell number three. Now, with all this, you know, uh, one of the enabling technology, basically, it is in order to make these things small, as you could tell from two millimeter to down to here, these devices is only 10 micrometer. Um, battery, it is a problem. Uh, battery is a problem, and therefore, uh, when I return back to academic from industry, uh, the first problem that I'm looking at it, that got my interest, it is how could we transmit power wirelessly to the device? Because um, transmitting data wirelessly over the air is the result of the transmission of power. And therefore, if we can transmit data, we should be able to transmit power to, to a device inside the body. And so several years ago, when I returned <coughs> back to academia, the first problem that I'm looking at, it is this problem. Uh, it's very interesting. Okay, because the, before I returned to academia, I worked at Sybeam, which is a 60 gigahertz uh, high data rate uh, uh, startup. So in, in wireless communication, we have the tendency to move up to higher and higher frequency. For example, from 2.4 uh, to 5 gigahertz and then to 60 gigahertz. The reason for that is we want to get higher data rates. And as I said, the transmission of data is the result of the transmission of power. And I'm wondering, you know, when, 
why most of the wireless power transmission system that is operating at very low frequency, for example, less than 10 megahertz or even lower. And that's the first doubt in my mind, why you know, those systems have to operate at such a low frequency while in data communication, we have, to then, we have the tendency to move up to higher and higher uh, frequency to get more data. And because of this, I did out the literature to understand why. And it was very interesting to find out that in the past 50 years, so basically it is in the 1960s and 1970s, there's a lot of analysis that is done to analyze the, how power or uh, our wave propagation over biological tissue. And in those studies, in, in those theoretical studies, um, we, because you know, we all know that tissue is lossy, and therefore researchers in the 1960s and 1970s, they ignore one of the terms that is in the Maxwell equation, which is the term in red, the displacement current, which is also the term that Maxwell added to the MPS law and then formed the well, well-known Maxwell equations. Now, in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, researchers, based on the, uh, uh, pres um, the fact that tissue is lossy, and this has only effect at high frequency. Therefore, when they, do when they did analysis, they removed this term. And the result of removing this term, uh, it agree with the assumption that this term is not important. So in those res analytical results, they, they showed that lower frequency is better. And therefore, thereafter, in the 1980s and 1990s, when people were architecting these systems, they take the results for granted and decide the system <coughs> operate at 10 megahertz or lower. So that's the history. So when, when I uh, look at this problem, I was very you know, in doubt of why you know, we have to remove this term. Maybe high frequency could be better. And therefore, uh, we include the displacement current, and then we perform a full wave analysis. So full wave analysis, basically, it is uh, when we do wireless communication, it is a far field approximation. When we did wi wireless powering that is based on inductive coupling, we did a near field approximation. And in our analysis, we don't want to favor whether it operates in far field or near field. Therefore, we perform a full wave analysis. That is, we don't have any bias whether it should be near field or far field. And we are able to show mathematically that the optimal frequency actually lies in the sub gigahertz to the gigahertz range, and it depends the we the optimal frequency which depends on the dimension of the transmit antenna. And because of this result, we also built a prototype power receiver that operates at one gigahertz, that it is a hundred times smaller than any of the current design at that um, two, two years ago, uh, at the same power transfer level and, and range, propagation range. Now to give you an idea on the first bullet, this is the equation that we're talking about. Um, this is the optimal frequency where each tissue type, we model it by the dielectric loss of each tissue just by four parameters. The first parameter is the relative permittivity at very low frequency, and then the second parameter is the relative permittivity at very high frequency. And then it is the, the time constant that changes to capture the change from low frequency to high frequency, which is the realization time constant. And then this is sigma conductivity, is the static conductivity. And D, it is the separation between the transmitter and the receiver, or you can interpret it as the depth of the implant. Now, for example, if we take D, the depth of the implant as one uh, centimeter, the optimal frequency for each of the different uh, tissue types, it is well above one gigahertz. So even though if we put the implant depth at 10 centimeter, it's still above one gigahertz. Because of this theoretical result, we go ahead and try to see that if we receive any obstacle, if we try to realize this result at high frequency. So this is the silicon that we built that it is operating at one gigahertz. It's very simple circuit. Um, it just have the unique features that is different from inductive coupling is we need to include adaptive conjugate matching because at very high frequency, tissue condition is not as predictable as we at low frequency. Therefore, we need to include some adaptation in the matching to the various tissue type. And also, at high frequency, uh, rectifier could be pretty uh, low efficiency. Therefore, the student did a very good job that he built a very high uh, efficiency rectifier that's 65%. And because of these two elite features, uh, we demonstrate in 2009 uh, with a 
receiver that has a coil dimension of two millimeter by two millimeter. Um, that is 100 times smaller than previous design in the literature at the same power transfer efficiency range. We, we did nothing but just move the frequency from 10 or you know, low frequency to the high frequency. And then just to build a circuit that is able to operate at that frequency. Because of this result, we're thinking about, okay, now we can transmit about 100 mi hundreds microwatt of power to an implant. What could we use it for? And being inspired by one of the greatest physicists, um, Richard Feynman, which is, I, I like him a lot. Uh, and in his uh, very famous paper, where, um, where, you know, I think in the nano world, you will see this paper reference a lot. But actually, in one of the paragraphs in that paper, Plenty of Room at the bottom, he mentioned that uh, what if we put a mechanical surgery inside the blood vessel? Uh, and it goes into the heart and looks around. And then it routes the information back. So when I ca the information routing, this part catch my attention because I'm doing wireless communication, right? And, and 10 years later, there's a movie, Fantastic Voyage. It is doing the same thing, you know, putting a submarine inside the bloodstream and travel around. Being inspired by this, uh, we're thinking about how about we utilize the power that we harvest from the RF wave. Um, to power out a gadget that is able to swim inside the body. And in order to do that, we, before I show you how we did it, I just want to show a, um, a short uh, animation to illustrate how we envision that this will be useful. So we envision that there will be a patient um, that will be lying on a bed that is made of permanent magnet, and there will be a transmitter here that, uh, what's it doing? It will provide the power and the command signal to the implant that is inside the body, or steer it. And then this implant, what we're building is just a vehicle. Application will define what this vehicle is going to carry. For example, it could carry some drugs or it could carry some sensors. But at this phase, what we carry up, care about is just building a vehicle that is able to travel. So what it's going to carry, we, we don't um, uh, put too much attention on it right now at this moment. Okay, so now, um, in order to achieve this, uh, um, this goal, uh, we first uh, we will the current propulsion methods. There's two major categories. One is the passive methods, another is the mechanical methods. The passive methods is very similar to those that we played around when we were a little kid, that if we put a magnet above a table, we put another magnet below it, we move the magnet below the table, right? The magnet above the table will follow its movement. Right? So basically, the way to move it, it is we, are, we have to create a magnetic field variation, either spatially or temporally. So this is, this is the uh, example that it creates a magnetic field gradient that is spatially, uh, like, uh, the, like those fields in the M B1 field of the MRI machine. And then these are the gadgets that is built to utilize when the magnetic field is changing uh, temporally. Therefore, whether there's an oscillating magnetic field or a rotating magnetic field. For example, this, is, this gadget it is moving inside a rotating magnetic field that is like a screwdriver and moving in, in a tank of water. But all these passive methods, it requires a very precise 3D control of the fields in order to uh, move the gadgets because the gadgets is just made of magnetic material, very simple. And it is very slow at small sizes. It moves very slowly. So another method, it is how about we build a motor and then put inside the gadgets, which is like in these cases, it is an endoscope. Uh, swallow it, patient can swallow the endoscope, which is more than 10 centimeter. Um, it's pretty scary. <laughs> And then, this is the middle part, the three part, middle sessions are the one corresponding to the motor rate, the, uh, the, motor rate, the, the locomotion. It's basically, there's a motor inside it. And then, um, it provides power wirelessly from the tail part, the head part, ah, from the tail part. The head part is the camera. Tail part, it is the power harvesting circuitry. It also get the power wirelessly. Um, this is too big, and also it consumes a lot of power for these gadgets to move. And therefore, we explore something like a man structure that in these cases, there's only a two membrane that uh, with a 
potential difference of 90 degree. The summation of this potential difference over these two flexible membrane will create a standing wave. So now let's imagine a standing wave membrane that it is pushing the fluid inside a cavity here. This is the cavity. And then when it pushed this standing wave, when it pushed the fluid inside the cavity, it made the cavity to move forward. Right? And we do a simulation on you know, exploring um, the, this idea to see how much power consumption. Well, in simulation, it consumes about one milliwatt for one centimeter per second movement, which is too high power. We can harvest hundreds of microwatt power, but milliwatt is, is too high. Therefore, is, this solution is also not workable for us. So now we, look, we take a more careful examination over the mechanical method and try to understand why it consumes so much power. In the mechanical method, basically what we're doing it is that the wireless power source, it converts the electrical energy into a mechanical motor. That is the standing wave that I talk about. This is this mechanical motion. This will introduce noise. Another source of loss, it is this mechanical motion that is the standing wave when it pushes the fluid inside the cavity. Um, that is to provide the uh, forward thrust. It also introduces quite a, amount, quite, you know, a lot of loss because it operates at very low Reynolds number regime. So because of these two losses, it requires about you know, one minute of power only in simulation to make the gadgets to move forward. Um, we were stuck in this problem for almost a year. <laughs> you know, we cannot get around with it, with this kind of power consumption. But the question is, why we have to go through all this uh, step to turn the power, electrical energy into mechanical motion and from mechanical motion to thrust? We have another um, uh, phenomenon, which is we did, we already know this when we were in high school. Uh, in high school, we you may already do the experiment like there's two minutes. If you put a wire that has a DC current over two minutes, what happened to this uh, wire? <laughs> it will move, right? So it's the Lorentz force. So how about we utilize that? We just um, <coughs> harvest the power, the AC current, we convert it into DC current and put this DC current over a piece of wire. And with this piece of wire putting into a putting in a static magnetic field instead of a magnetic field gradient, then this wire will move forward, right? So they are basically, in these cases, if we are able to have a static magnetic field in this direction, uh, <coughs> this is the current, then the gadgets will move in this direction, to so the left hand move. But the problem with this solution, it is it requires uh, a conductive fluid in order to compete the current because we can, there's no way to make a, um, if we make a loop, for example, here, if we do compete the current outside a conductive fluid, that would be a loop. When there's a loop, it will just produce torque, and therefore it will not produce a forward movement. So in the case when we did the experiment when we were in high school, part of the wire, it is inside the magnetic field. Another part of the wire, it is outside the magnetic field. And we cannot mimic this in this situation. But this is good, this is for why it's starting point for us that um, to make the gadgets to move in a conductive fluid. So we keep exploring to see if there's other methods that it doesn't require conductive fluid in order to compete the current path. Um, as I mentioned, right, if there's, a current, if there's a current loop and if this is the magnetic field, if this is the current loop, what will happen to this current loop if this is the steady magnetic field? Uh, the magnetic moment, if this is the current loop, will be in this direction. If there's a static magnetic field in here, it will talk. If I change the current in the other direction, it will talk in the other way. Agree? And therefore, this is a very, uh, it, it is a very energy efficient way to provide talk. If, you just, if we just change the current direction, we can have this current loop to talk either in this direction or in the other direction. So imagine that if I have an implant that is well around with this current loop, I put it in a static magnetic field, I just change the current direction of this loop. I am able to make these gadgets to either rotate in, 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 the, in this direction, in the clockwise direction, in the cut-down clockwise direction, or steer it to rotate in any direction. Now, providing the torque, still, we cannot make it move it. Right? We, we can make it rotate, but it doesn't mean that it moves. 
So we stuck in here for another year. And eventually, we keep brainstorming, right? Talk about you know, how we walk, how we um, uh, different kind of movement. Um, actually, we're inspired by walking, but I find it kayaking is much easier to explain how we make this gadget working. Now, in kayaking, we have a paddle. This paddle, when we do the movements in this direction or in the other direction, it is like this current loop that in a static magnetic field, we are able to make it to talk in this direction, in the other direction. Agree, right? So now in kayaking, one of the paddles is inside the water, and that he has, it has high draft force. And therefore, the kayak it is able to move forward a little bit. Okay, and then I rotate it, and then the, the other paddle, it is inside the water, it has high draft force. Therefore, it could create the seaside movement. So in our case, this current loop, basically, it is this, the paddle in the kayaking. But how can we make the asymmetrical draft force? We make the shape asymmetrical because the whole gadget is inside the water. We cannot use the idea of kayaking that one of the paddles is inside, one of the paddles is outside to create the asymmetrical force. What we could do it is to make the gadget itself asymmetrical in shape, such that, um, in this case, the, the blue arrow is the draft force due to uh, the blue arrow, it is the EM torque due to this uh, ro rotating of the current loop. And then the red arrow is due to the draft force. Because of the asymmetrical in shape of the device, one direction has high draft force, the other direction has no draft force. And therefore, the gadgets can move one step. So now I change the current such that the EM torque will be in the opposite direction. And then it will be able to move, this one is able to move a little bit. So we try to explore, see if this idea would work. So this is the U-shaped object that we talk about. This is the current wire. That this is the one pool wire, the, the top. And this is uh, the water surface. We put the gadgets inside the water. We turn the current direction through this wire. Make it forward or backward. And then it's able to do the seaside movement inside the water. Now, in this uh, demonstration, um, there's still a wire here. Well, we are doing wireless. We don't like this wire. So let's get rid of this wire. And then, before we can get rid of it, we need to know how much current is needed to put on the current coil in order to make it to move with one centimeter per second. So we do a uh, full dynamic uh, simulation to see you know, both methods. This is the method based on just exploring Lorentz force. That is, it requires a conductive fluid. This is the oscillation one, that's the one I just showed. Uh, both methods will require about uh, one amp of current over the current loop in order to move, for the gadget to move about one centimeter per second. So one amp of current, we can do it using CMOS, and therefore we go ahead and build the device. And this is the, the, um, the circuit that we're building that with the two millimeter by two millimeter receive antenna uh, relative to a uh, penny, the dimension. And then this is the transmitter. Um, so basically, the transmitter will provide the data and also provide the power for these uh, gadgets. The upper path is to harvest the, wire, harvest the power. The lower path, it is to receive the command signal from the outside to ask it to change, you know, because it has the CSAP movement. Therefore, the signal to change the current direction it is receiving by this demodulator. And this demodulator will demodulate the signal from the external transmitter and then tell the digital controller. And then uh, the digital controller will tell the propulsion system whether it should be forward current or reverse current, something like that. And in order to provide a very high current, one amp of current, uh, in our rectifier, we have four stage rectifier. The first stage, we purposely make it very low voltage such that it has high current, such that we can provide this one amp of current that is run around the, um, the coil for the movement. So in this, this is the power breakdown of the um, system. Uh, propulsion requires the highest amount of power to over 200 microwatt. The other mod data demodulator or digital controller only consumes about 20 microwatt. And this is the silica that, uh, this is connecting to the antenna. This is the six pack. If you still remember the gadget, right? We had three coils, orthogonal coils. So it requires six uh, electro pads that we connect each 
pair will connect to one coil. So that's the, that's, therefore at the end we have these three dimensional coils, correct our warning. Uh, we do the experiment with the first method, which is the manitro, um, um method, that is the one require a conductive fluid. So it's basically it's direct application of the Lorentz force. So here in this demonstration, we want to demonstrate that we are able to move this gadget if we provide power from the transmitter. And then when we remove the power source, it stops moving. So the manner is here. And another one, I want to illustrate navigation. Um, we want to, this gadget to move to this dock. Therefore, initially it is moving in this direction, right? We send a command for this uh, um, receiver to ask it to steer to the direction of the metal foil. Okay. Okay. Um, this is number one, the, the first method. The second method is the one I like more. Um, the one that doesn't require uh, conductive fluid. So the one is based on, you know, inspired by, you know, kayaking or walking. Walking has the same phenomenon. The jet force becomes the vision from the floor. Um, so minus here, we try the magnet is at the back, um, the transmitter, and then the gadget. Here. <laughs> this one, we encounter some problem. So it moves, but it moves. It has a very strong force, as you could tell from the video. But it moves pretty um, un not that controllable. So if we put the magnet at the bottom, um, then it moves slower and it's more controllable. Now, one of the problem with this one basically is because it's also uh, illustrate one of the issues with wireless power link, even the current wireless power link. It is very sensitive to the orientation of the receiver, right? If the receiver coil, it is, for example, for the cochlear implant, if the receive coil is not aligned with the transmit coil, the efficiency could vary a lot. Right. And in this case, it's because our gadget, it is oscillating. When it oscillates, the link efficiency varies a lot with the transmitter. And that's the, the, one of the problems that we have to solve. If we really want to make the oscillation one, that is the one without the need of the conductive fluid to work, we have to solve the problem. How can we decide the transmitter that it is insensitive to the orientation of the receiver? Which is a problem that encounter in, in the current uh, wireless implant as well. Now, this is problem number one. The second problem, it is um, another problem that we, are, we, are, we would like to solve is, I want to give a, a, a background on um, in the gigahertz range wireless powering, we are operating at different regime. In the inductive coupling one, it is operating in this regime where the dimension of the transmitter, it is very small with respect to the wavelength. But, at one gigahertz, the wavelength is about four centimeter, which is on the same dimension, about the same dimension as the transmitter, and also the same dimension as the transmitter, the, the separation between the transmitter and the receiver here. So we are operating, actually, it is in this regime that is in between the near field and the far field, um, the first level zone, on the edge of the first level zone. In this zone, the, the thing it is, what we could do better than uh, using just a loop antenna is we can fo manipulate the electromagnetic fields to focus to the direction of the implant and then also to minimize uh, the loss due to the electric field. So we can maximize the magnetic field to the implant while minimize, try to redistribute the electric field to minimize the loss. At the same time, we can also desensitize the system to the effect of receiver misalignment. So because of this, we try to think about, you know, what's the best we could do if we are allowed to uh, implement any transmitter. Now, we, we don't want to bond it by just using a loop. 
as you could, you could see in our experiment, we use a loop, we put that a loop operating at high frequency, one gigahertz can get a higher uh, power transfer efficiency. But what if we are not bounded to use a loop, first of all? Second, how can we make decided transmitter such that it will, be inver it will be insensitive to the orientation of the receiver? So these are the two questions we want to solve. Now, um, so when I, I did my PhD dissertation at Berkeley, I studied uh, information theory. So information theory was my, my major. Uh, in information theory, we always like to solve this kind of problem. You know, what is the maximum data rate it could be achieved in a certain channel? So don't, don't, uh, don't bother about how to implement it, but what's the best you could do for a given channel? And for this problem, we want to answer the same question. If there's no constraint on the transmitter, but there's only a constraint on the receiver because it is put inside the body, is there an upper limit on the power transfer efficiency that you know, um, we cannot do better than that, no matter what? So we try to find answer to this question, and afterwards, like in information theory, right? After we know what will be the channel capacity, we would like to get some insights on how to achieve that channel capacity. So we are, I'm adopting similar approach by answering the upper bound through the way we try to solve the upper bound. We want to know what will be a good transmitter to decide. And in order to study this problem, like the uh, Shannon's uh, capacity theorem, right? If that was an additive white Gaussian channel, we also need a certain model of our channel. So we model our channel, which is the tissue, into a multi-layer pendulary tissue model. So for example, this is the chest wall that if we uh, cut across here, uh, we try to model this uh, chest wall, for example, with the multi-layer. The first layer could be the uh, skin, fat, muscle, bone, and so on. So our, t our channel model, it is a multi-layer pendulary tissue model. Um, so for the source, it is arbitrary. How can we model a source that is arbitrary? We apply equivalence principle. Equivalence principle basically telling us that um, if we have a very complicated 3D source, the field can be represented by 2D source. That it is at the, uh, when, when this 2D source, this layer, so it could be any sources above it, but it could and any of these sources, the field could be mimicked by equivalent sources on these two D layers that is above the tissue interface. Okay, so we have a model for the for the medium. We also have a model for the source. It's just the two D surface currents. It could be J and M. That is, it could be electric current, magnetic current. So now we are ready to solve the Maxwell equations to see if there's an upper limit on the power transfer efficiency. And fortunately, we're able to find a close form solution on what will be the optimal current distribution and also what will be the optimal power transfer efficiency. So the answer to this question, yes, there's a theoretical upper bound with the model that we, we placed for um, in the previous slide. And with this uh, upper bound, which is the solid curve, now the dotted curve is the result we got earlier. This solid curve is the result we got earlier, uh, the, and we showed that our one gigahertz could be good. But this is the, with the new result that we got if we don't have any constraint on the transmitter. When the impact, it is at four centimeters deep inside the body, which is about the surface of the heart. So you could see that there's about 10 dB imp improvement if we can design a more intelligent transmitter. So now, in order to understand why, you know, where this 10 dB comes from, we're looking at the field, the magnetic and the electric field, try to understand why, why it could do better. Um, this is the case without any optimization from a loop. Um, this is the um, magnetic field. This is the SAR, which is the tissue absorption. Now, you can see that the magnetic field, it is concentrated at the surface. And for the tissue absorption, the hotspot is also very close to the surface. If we do find the optimal sources, try to focus the e electromagnetic field. In this case, it's try to focus the magnetic field. So this is the magnetic field. If we are able to decide pretty good transmitter, we are able to focus the magnetic field to the, the implant. In this case, it is at minus four. 
So it's four centimeters deep inside the tissue. This is the implant location. So it's the magnetic field kind of focused to the direction of the implant. While this is the tissue absorption, this is the tissue absorption. It pushed the hotspot further down inside tissue. So because we can increase the receive power and at the same time make the hotspot deeper, more evenly distributed over the tissue, we're able to get that 10 dB improvement in the um, transfer efficiency if we can design the transmitter right. Now this is based on a theoretical model. We also did the uh, phantom simulation to see you know, if we apply this transmitter over a human body, um, kind of phantom, digital phantom, what will happen? So we have our own in-house uh, FDTT phantom for the body. Um, this shows the results for the, um, this is the tissue absorption. So they are, they are at 200 megahertz and 1.7 gigahertz, they have similar tissue absorption. But the receive power in the curve in here, it's go much deeper. As you can see, that's the focusing effect here. Right, well, with relative to the low frequency one. And this is the results for the FTDT, the, the phantom simulation versus the theory one. Both results agree at around 1.7 gigahertz. At low frequency, um, it deviates because at low frequency, tissue, the wavelength is large. When the wavelength is large, if we model the tissue as a planetary uh, structure, it doesn't very mimic the, the real you know, body. Right. That's the reason why at low frequency, the result is not that. It's not as good as here. That's the, this gap. And then we also show what will be the, uh, the voltage, which is very important when we decide the implant circuits because So we also study the receive open voltage, which is very important when we decide IC, because IC has certain threshold voltage that we can turn on the circuit. If the induced voltage on the IC, it is not above certain threshold voltage, we cannot turn on the circuits. So um, we also study the uh, open circuit voltage and also the amount of receive power that is under the safety regulations. So after this, uh, theory, we want to know, you know, okay, great. If we can decide the transmitter right, we are able to get high efficiency. But how to decide it, right? In information theory, we, we could just answer the question, what's the capacity? We don't need to answer, you know, how we are going to implement the source coding or channel coding in order to achieve that. But in our cases, we'll also like to see how to achieve it. Now, first of all, uh, instead of looking at our original example that's trying to power up something that is put in on the surface of the heart of a human body, we let's look at the web first. We want to build a prototype to realize the theory that is able to power up something that is put in on the surface of a heart of a rabbit. And this is the theoretical current distribution. And this is the current distribution from the antenna structure that we think it will be mimic the theoretical uh, distribution. Now, as you could see from here, the current is going up. This one is also going up in here. Right, so this is basically, it is a slot antenna structure that the, the one on the left, it is the current distribution of a slot antenna. The one on the right, it is the current theoretical current distribution. But now we cannot know a particular antenna structure that will mimic the optimal current distribution. Let's build it and measure how, it, how it's going. Um, this is the, the antenna that we're building in order to mimic the optimal current distribution. This is the loop of the same dimension. 
But as you could see that if we use a loop, if the receiver it is rotating with different angles, the change in the efficiency could be huge. And that's the reason why our oscillating gadgets in the locomotive implant, it, 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 when it is moving, it moves and counts unpredictably because of the change in the length efficiency. And this is our proposed antenna. It's very robust to any orientation of the receiver. And the efficiency, actually, it is higher than the best of the loop orientation. Okay. So this is the best side of our proposed antenna. Um, so in any regard, our proposed antenna is do better than the loop um, in terms of the sensitivity to the tissue composition and also to the acceleration, which is a way to measure um, um, how much uh, independency of the transmitter to the orientation of the receiver. So lastly, we have to answer the question, is it safe to use compared to a loop? So this is, we conduct a sound measurement to see whether, you know, every we got our proposed antenna seems better than a loop, but we have to answer the last question, is this a safety one? This is the robot that we're doing the sound measurement. Um, transmitter is put on here. This is the phantom. This is the e poke. And this is the sound measurement. Um, surface sound, I only plot the surface sound. We also did the volume, volume uh, sound measurement. For a loop, and this is the sound uh, distribution for our proposed antenna. Uh, from the measurement, they're very close. Actually, in the measurement, our proposed antenna has lower SAR than the loop. In both the P SAR and also the P, uh, spatial average SAR, over one centimeter cube of volume. So in conclusion, for the testing of that antenna that is inspired by the theory that we are going to test it with the rapid rapid heart, in any regard, the proposed antenna is better than the conventional loop antenna. And the next one, okay, we can do this antenna to test it on the rabbit, but we want to apply it to a human body, right? Now, to implement those for the human body, the current distribution is much more difficult. Yeah, it's pretty complicated. So in order to get that 10 dB, it's not that easy. But fortunately, recently, we also have an antenna structure that is able to get that. We, we are able to get about 8.5 improvement. So not 10, but 8.5, but it's still pretty good. So uh, right now, what we're doing is try to make that antenna structure to be insensitive to the orientation of the receiver. So stay tuned. Maybe next time, I could show you this antenna. Um, and in addition to that, now, since when we studied this problem, we say, okay, let's assume that we can have an infinite sheet as the transmitter, the equipment source. But in reality, it is impos impossible to have an infinite dimension transmitter. And in here, our theoretical result also gives the dimension about, you know, maybe, you know, uh, eight centimeter, it is large enough for the transmitter. For example, for the one for the weapon, we could show that it is about two centimeters large enough if we want to power up a range of about one centimeter. In this case, if we want to power up a range of about four centimeter, eight centimeter transmitter should be good enough if we can mimic this current distribution. All right, so now with this transmitter that we are able to give pretty large amount, higher amount, you know, larger amount of power to the implant that is deeper. What we want to do is we want to apply it to power up some, a whole bunch of electro sensors um, that's put them on the surface of the coronary artery. So in this project, we're working with uh, three cardiologists that trying to um, wish, uh, realize that. So orientation independent, it is very important in this case because we have only one transmitter and that transmitter is going to power up a whole bunch of sensors here. And there's no way for us to really align the transmitter with all the sensors. Therefore, orientation independent, it is very important in our transmitter design. And this is the silicon. Uh, we are now testing the chip at Stanford. Um, hopefully it will work and then we will go for animal model testing in the next step. So let's see, maybe next time we could also talk about this. Uh, finally, I would like to conclude the talk with the 
um, the third project that I show um, at the beginning of this talk that is also inspired by Richard Feynman. Uh, this is a cancer cell. Um, for a cancer cell in a payload of about 5 by 5 micrometer, we can put over 1,000 transistors, which is the same number of transistors in the first generation of microprocessor. So what does it mean? It means that we can do a lot um, with this kind of payload. And to echo is what Richard Feynman say, there's a plenty of room in a cell. In, instead of at the bottom, there's plenty of room in a cell. We can do a lot. So what we're going to utilize it? Huh, we're thinking about, you know, how about we put a sensor with a um, transceiver such that we can in interrogate it from outside to see what's going on inside itself from a transceiver. Um, this is a near-term goal. A long-term goal, it is how about these uh, sensors within a cell is able to talk with each other, which is forming the smallest cellular system because it's really within a cell. Um, so, but then this is too far off, you know. Let's start with something simple. It is just to put the devices inside a cell and then it's able to communicate with it. So to solve this problem, there's three, there's three problems. One, it is um, how can we design sensors such small, such that we are able to, um, to send something. The second problem, it is how to design the wireless systems to detect such a weak signals. And the third is the fabrication one. Uh, we try to partition this problem into stages. Instead of worrying about you know, how to design the sensor such small in order to put inside cell, we partition it. We have uh, people that is doing sensors try to scale it down to the cellular level. And at the same time, we are designing tags, what I call is the micro tags, that have different identity um, to try out the wireless link, the design of the wireless link. Okay, so let's give you an idea. This is one of the tests that we are doing. Uh, with, so, I think time's out. <laughs> um, and we designed this test with different resonant frequency. So this test basically have the inductor and the capacitor structure, and it forms an LC resonators. That different structure will have different resonant frequency. We put it inside a white blood cells, and it's very surprising to us that the white blood cells is so hungry that it will eat even though the device is pretty large. This is another device that is different from the previous one, will resonate at different frequency. Okay, so now at this stage, we are trying to study, it is what we are doing, it is how to detect the, these uh, signals from, the, from these resonators. That's what we are working on pretty hard in solving this problem. And at the same time, we have problems from biologists saying that, okay, you can put the silicon inside the cell, but what happened to the cell afterwards? So we did a five days arrival study. On day one, this cell is moving. On day five, the same one is still moving. Therefore, we roughly say that, you know, um, the cell still survive after it updated the silicon. So we are now really solving the problem, it is how to detect such a weak signal from these devices. And this concludes my talk that we demonstrate a millimeter size wireless power and we mostly control local motive implant. Where right now we are actively improving the systems. We have more feedback control and more stable link. Uh, focus wireless power transfer, the theory on focus power transfer from theory to practical antenna design. And design, develop the wireless cardio pop to sense and pace the heart remotely. And finally, it is this what we call the um, uh, we see a convergence of wireless technology, nanofabrication, and also intracellular delivery that is happening on the other side of our campus. Let's put together and then try to develop an intracellular IC probes. And this concludes my talk. Thank you. So I know some of you may have to go off to class, but if you have t anyone has any questions, I'm sure we have time for a few. And if you do, please use the mic. The microtag stuff is really neat. I was wondering, do you have a mechanism for getting it into a non-macrophage cell? Like uh, something micro, that... We also work with our collaborate, another collaborators. Okay. It is to explore micro-injection. OK, into the surface. Yeah. Neat. Cool. Thank you. OK, we have one back here. 
the uh, surface of the heart is going to fluctuate pretty wildly when it's beating. What sort of a percentage in fluctuation of the electric power received uh, would, would you expect to see? And you, can you compensate for that? And also, have you considered maybe when you have a, a wildly fluctuating thing like a heart surface, maybe a, using a piezo generator might be effective? Yeah, so we also, you know, right now we focus on the power generations from RF wave, but we will not rule out any other possibilities. But right now, you know, we just want to do the proof of concept first. Once we, are, we demonstrate we could do it, that we could think about, you know, other energy sources. Yeah, that's a very good question. Okay, well, if we don't have any more questions, just want to thank you again for a great talk. Okay.